Okay, well, thank you so much and welcome everyone for joining us this morning on this lovely Saturday to learn more about this new drought hack plant and design ideas for the fall. We're joined by the lovely Juanita Salisbury and this is brought to you by a partnership between the Alameda County Water District and the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency or BOSCA. And I'm Megan Marino. I am a water use efficiency specialist for ACWD. And I work on um, bringing landscape workshops to our customers as well as rebates and things that um, I'll kind of get into later. As just as an overview, I'll give a brief introduction, a little bit about ACWD and BOSCA, and then I'll introduce our lecturer this morning, and then we'll have some time for questions towards the end. Um, so let's get started. We are all Zoom experts, but if you are, need a reminder, all attendees will be muted by default, but we do encourage you to ask questions. You can put them in the chat or the Q&A. And if you'd like to raise your hand at any point, that's at the bottom there for you, as well as the Q&A. A uh, little bit about ACWD, you might be aware we um, have some restrictions in place related to water use because we are in an extreme drought. So we declared a drought emergency. And the ordinance that we enforce is basically has some goals to minimize landscaping irrigation, minimize water waste, and restrict other non-essential uses. So things like the use of a decorative fountain currently are prohibited during drought, as well as uh, runoff from irrigation, not fixing leaks, or breaks within your um, irrigation or plumbing within 72 hours. And just in general, like um, irrigating hardscapes, stuff like that is just uh, prohibited at this time. So some announcements, we do have another upcoming landscape workshop on the 26th at 6 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. And this one's all about capturing rainwater and stormwater, which Hopefully we'll be getting some this winter so you can learn about rain barrels and um, irrigation practices that will reduce, uh, capture that rainfall and utilize it. And then another um, thing, just starting October 1st, we reduced the allowed number of watering days down to one day per week for sprinklers. So if you have drip or efficient irrigation like drip, then um, that does not apply, but any above ground irrigation is limited to one day per week. And you'll see in this schedule here, um, during the summer, we were at two days per week. October is one day per week. And then in November, December, and through winter is one day every other week for uh, Fremont, Newark, and Union City. So the Alameda County Water District, um, you know, we strive, our mission is to provide a reliable supply of high quality water at a reasonable price for our customers. And we were, we've been doing this or we've been um, supplying water to the Tri-City area since 1914, so over 100 years. Our service area is about 105 square miles, so pretty large area that serves 357,000 customers with over 84,000 connections. And the breakdown of our supplies you can see in that chart um, or graph, we have three different sources of supply, the state water project. So uh, state water that comes from the Delta, San Francisco PUC, which is the Hetchesi base, but we purchased from San Francisco. And then the Alameda Creek watershed runoff, which includes the Nalcone groundwater basin and Alameda Creek. So this is our local supply. Um, and this diverse water supply portfolio really allows us to weather droughts pretty well, but each one of these sources right now are sort of in critical conditions because of dry weather. So that's why we had to declare a water shortage emergency. Now for a bit about our programs. Uh, we offer several different incentives and programs to residential customers, including the landscape workshops you're attending today. Um, but some of our other programs I wanted to highlight is the Ratio Smart Sprinkler Controller Instant Rebate. Typically, these are about $300, and you can get it for $100 through our instant rebate. And this is really a smart device that connects to your irrigation controller, 
and will irrigate based on weather conditions. So if it's super foggy and there's moisture in the air, um, the app will let you know to water less. It's this, um, connected to an application on your phone and it's a really great way to dial in some of your irrigation practices. Another uh, tool I wanted to highlight is the WaterWise gardening online tool. This is brought to you by Bosca, our co-sponsor. And anytime you're um, you know, looking at renovating your landscape, I love to recommend this tool just because it gives you images of the plants. You know, instead of scientific names, sometimes you gotta do some Google searching, but this tool will just show you the plant, show you the height and width that it will grow at full maturity and its water needs. So if you're uh, participating in one of our rebate programs to convert your turf to water efficient landscaping, this is a great resource. So moving on, um, one of our most popular programs during the drought has been the turf conversion program. So we incentivize customers to rip out their water thirsty lawn and convert it to native and low water use plants at $2 per square foot. Um, so you have to apply prior to doing any conversion, but um, we really encourage people to take advantage of this offering because the dollar per square footage was increased due to drought conditions. So it used to be $1, now it's $2. So it's really a great time to take advantage of the funding that we have for this drought. And it's a huge water saver. Some of the requirements, um, we do ask that all plants that are installed are low water use. Um, drip irrigation is the only irrigation that is allowed through the program because it's the most efficient. So all your old sprinkler system must be capped and removed. We do ask that 50% of the area is covered with low water use plants because it really provides a lot of benefits that you'll be hearing about later. Um, mulch must be at least three inches and hardscape must be permeable. So that's really because um, we wanna reduce the stormwater runoff. Like if it was concrete, you know, just run into the drains and also it helps replenish our groundwater. If water can percolate through the hardscape and into the soil. So you can learn more about this and all of our other rebates at acwd.org forward slash rebates. Now a little bit about Bosca, our co-sponsor, the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. There's 26 uh, agencies that make up Bosca, so you can kind of see in that map, they're all Bay Area water agencies that have come together to sort of, um, what unifies us is that we all buy water from San Francisco Public Utilities, that Hetch Hetchy water I was referring to earlier. And so um, they serve over one point million people with that water from SFUC, including many businesses and communities in Alameda County, Santa Clara County, and San Mateo. Just a quick note, um, the presentation is general in nature and does not intend to be exhaustive review of the subject and information presented today does not necessarily reflect the policies of ACWD or BOSCA and the presentation instructor information and products provided are just as courtesy and are not endorsed by ACWD or BOSCA. And in closing, um, if you have any questions, there's my contact information. Our team, the Water Use Efficiency team will answer the phone and email inquiries that come through on that number there, as well as the email listed. And we're happy to help any um, customers with questions and you can also put some in the chat for me. I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Juanita Salisbury. Uh, she is has a very extensive list of accolades. She has a PhD in biopsychology from the University of Florida. She's a landscape architecture, ar ar architecturist. So she does landscape designs and plans for people in the Bay Area. And then in 2009, she um, established landscape architecture after working for commercial and residential design firms. She recently turned her focus to California native plants and pollinator habitats. And then in 2016, she established the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, 
which is the first of five pollinator habitat gardens in Palo Alto, which we'll be learning more about. And her focus is to research and relay information on these habitats and explore opportunities to install more. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the Primrose uh, website in the chat, as well as her Instagram and Facebook handles, because um, once you learn more, I'm sure you'll be wanting to follow her updates. So without further ado, thank you, Anita, and welcome. Go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Megan. All right, uh, share screen. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about drought hacks, plant and design ideas for the fall. And fall is what we like to call the planting season. Um, so we're going to talk about that and uh, how plants can actually help us save water. Um, and you can follow the progress of me and the adventures in five gardens and growing uh, to six soon um, on Facebook and Instagram, the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden. And I also have a YouTube channel, Primrose Way. If you're not interested in social media, I do have uh, a website, Primrose Way Primrose, that should say primrosewaypollinatorgarden.com, not primrose pollinator. It's primrosewaypollinatorgarden.com. We have uh, five gardens, as I mentioned before, uh, the Primrose Garden here. Um, this is in Palo Alto, this is in Barcadero Road. And we have the Island Drive Garden, the Arcadia Place Garden, Hopkins Avenue and Gwenda Street Pollinator Gardens. And we'll be connecting the Primrose Way Garden with the Gwenda Street Garden via the Embarcadero Road Pollinator Corridor Project, which is about a quarter mile long. So uh, a lot going on in terms of uh, native plant gardens. What I'm going to talk about today, um, so basically I'm going to talk about these broad concepts that, dis that guide our decisions. Instead of just kind of taking guesses at what works. I'm going to give you uh, these broad concepts because a broad concept can be applied to most situations. I will give a few specific examples. Those may not work for everybody, but using those broad concepts can be applied to most situations. I'm going to talk about form following function. As a designer, I'm all about what things are doing in the environment, how they're supposed to work, what is their function. We're gonna talk about getting rid of that lawn, uh, some lawn alternatives, native trees and plants, and then maintenance and some other considerations. So when we are trying to decide what to plant, do you find yourself going to the nursery and being overwhelmed by, miles and miles, it seems like, of flats and wandering the aisles with an empty wheelbarrow, not knowing where to start. Um, it can be overwhelming. And maybe you're like this guy here who finds a hanging basket and already these pansies have started to go to seed and he, you know, it looks pretty, you know, he's been, he's paying for this and she's happy that she's getting rid of these plants. Is there a better way to make plant choices? So I always tell people, know how plants are going to fit into the environment so that you can make a plan and that, will, that plan will help you to narrow the choices based on what you need and your situations before you shop. So you can be like this guy and come with a list so you know exactly what you want. You don't necessarily have to wear a tie, but you know, make a plan before you shop. That way you'll be less, um, less overwhelmed and you'll have done your homework and you know what you want and you can really uh, be efficient with your time. Um, and so using the system that I use um, where you look at how native plants work in the environment, it helps guide your decision rather than telling you exactly what to plant. Um, I'm going to tell you kind of like the broad overview of how to choose things that work and why. Because um, as I mentioned before, specific plants don't work in every garden, but the system actually does work for making decisions. 
So let's talk about form following function. As a designer, I'm all about the function. And when it comes to designing, think about how you're going to use an area outside. Are you going, where are you going to walk? Where are you going to sit? Where are you going to plant? What, you know, what do you want to do? How do you want to use the area? Think of it almost like being inside a house. You have your living room, you have your bathroom, you have your kitchen. These areas have functions. The same is true outside. What are the functions of the various areas? And for those functions, do you actually need a lawn? So use function-based decision-making to optimize your water use outside. We know that outdoor irrigation accounts for most of a home's water use and lawns can use up to uh, you know, 50% of water use. So consider the function on whether you need a lawn or not. So what are lawns used for? And note, people at this party are all on the patio. Um, maybe we don't need a lawn. We have one little girl running across the lawn, but do we need a, a huge lawn for this, uh, this particular yard? Um, we know that mowing intensively increases weeds and lawn pests, and it's a lot of work or expense to have people come in and mow your lawn once a week. Um, it's just, you know, reconsider whether you actually need a lawn. So one of the things that I do as a landscape architect is I design irrigation systems for people. And um, I wanted to kind of see if the research that says that lawns can use up to like 50% of the outdoor water use, if this was true. So I did uh, look at the, um, the typical water use for a, a new three bedroom home, and it shows the fixture type, the flow rates, times and daily uses to figure out that this home is using about 46,521 gallons of water per year. And then I did an irrigation plan for um, a very similar house, and uh, I did what's called a water budget calculation. Um, it's not that hard to do, it's just a little tedious, where you look at these different zones of water use, and this is per valve. So you have irrigation valves that water different areas. And um, whether the plants were low water use, moderate, um, high, that kind of thing. And so I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but um, what, I dis what I discovered is, again, outdoor water use is actually more than the in interior use. We're, this house is, is going to be using about 63,000 gallons of water per year. And the lawn area um, is using 28,000 plus gallons per year, or almost half of the total outside irrigation, but it's only 19% of the landscape area. So huge water hog um, and for outside, for this whole outside and inside together, the outside is using almost 60% going to irrigation. So if we can get rid of um, the lawn and the irrigation that it's using, reduce it down, then we can really reduce the total amount of water that this house is using. And you're going, okay, Juanita, but I need to know how much water a plant is using. And so there's a handy um, website that we can go to. And this is the uh, water use classification of landscape species. And that's an online searchable database for plant factors of individual plant species. And it's published by the University of California Cooperative Extension and the California Department of Water Resources. Here's the link. Um, and um, what they do is they, they rank plants based on their percent of water use of turf grass. Turf grass is 100%. And then the plant factor is basically that percent. So a very low water use is 0 to 10% of turf grass. Low is 20 to 30% and so forth. So a handy tool that we can use um, to figure out, you know, what are these very low and low water use plants. Um, to get rid of your lawn, you know, an easy way so you're not 
pulling up the turf grass, which is um, going to be maybe not good for the soil, is sheet mulching. And there's a great uh, resource that you can go to, the Lawn to Garden, um, which tells you how to do sheet mulching, which I'm not going to go into because people can go and look to see how that works. Um, it's pretty easy. And um, so you're not, with sheet mulching, you're not digging up uh, the, the lawn. You're basically piling on cardboard, you know, from those Amazon deliveries or whatever boxes that you might have or whatever the neighbors might give you um, with mulch and soil on the top. And you can plant right through it. It'll smother the lawn underneath, which will decompose and feed the soil. Um, so super easy way to transform your lawn into a garden. And after you do this, um, you put down this nice layer of mulch. One of my favorite kinds of layers of mulches is this mini bark mulch. It's really pretty, very decorative, and it gives you a nice clean slate. It gives you that very uniform look um, that a lot of people like in a garden, um, and you can walk on it. So one of the functions of a lawn is to provide places for people to walk, and you can certainly walk between plants here. So that's uh, just a really nice clean look for a garden area that you can walk on. Um, now, some people say, but I really want some grass. You know, I don't want to completely get rid of my lawn. What can I do? Well, you can use grasses that don't use as much water as a non-native uh, grass type. And so what I often specify as a landscape architect is from a company, Delta Bluegrass, which provides these native sod blends. Uh, there's the native mofri over here on the left, which is nice, or a native bent grass. Um, it's available as sod from Delta Bluegrass, or you can use seeds to seed in things. If you're starting to like pull out some of the, the weeds in your front lawn and you have a bare spot, this is what I've been doing. Um, I've been seeding in um, agrostis palins, um, which, you know, stays green most of the year for me, and it looks really nice, and um, you don't have to mow it, obviously, this name is mow-free, and you get this kind of soft sort of meadow look, um, and it uses maybe a quarter as much water as um, regular turf grass, so very low water use. Um, and so these are what they call bunch grasses. They don't, they, they, they grow in like little bunches and um, they, they kind of have this nice little puffy look. You can walk on them. Um, you can have stepping stones in between them, super low water use. There's these weird strips sometimes you get between, um, you know, the street and the sidewalk. They can look good in these places and they have this kind of soft flowing look or if you want to, you can use a non-native ground cover. This is um, between some stepping stones and it's a non-native thyme called elfin. It's for pretty low water use. So there's alternatives to regular turf grass that you can walk on. Um, now, if you just want a green swath of, you know, something low growing, if you don't really walk across your lawn and you're like looking for that green look, lots of native plants will fit the bill for you. And here's a specific example. This may not work for everybody, but it works in this particular situation. This is one of our native uh, Ceanothus, and it's Ceanothus frisiflorus, and it is a scientific name, but think of it as like first name and last name, which everybody has one of those, and this is what this is. Um, this is evergreen, which means it stays green all year. And it's this nice dark green, so it doesn't look dry and desiccated during the summertime. Um, has nice blue blossoms in the spring. It can grow in sun and part shade. And it's very low water, maybe once a month during the summertime. Um, super easy to grow, fast growing, fills in quickly. It's just a great uh, specific alternative suggestion if you have a situation that might it might work. Another alternative, uh, a specific situation is Achillea millifolium. This is semi evergreen, so it'll kind of go dormant and die back a little bit during the winter time. This is a nice filler plant um, between other plants, spreads by runners, you can mow it. 
um, it, the lots of blossoms in different colors, pinks, whites, reds, and so forth, and it grows in part shade. Another uh, ground cover that can fill in, um, which I like, and this gives you these great little strawberries is Frigaria vesca, uh, which spreads by runners. Um, also evergreen, super easy to propagate. I have this in a lot of my gardens and I take a berry if I want a new plant and I just toss it to where I want a new plant and I get a lot of sprouting. So super easy to grow and the berries taste like candy. Just really a great plant. Another alternative to lawn that's a ground cover, Salvia Bees Bliss. And these plants grow very quickly. Um, this is about 12 inches tall, a little taller in the center where the main roots are. And in two years, it spread to eight feet across and it will just keep going. So you actually, we actually do trim this one back from the curb um, because it will grow out into the street if it gets the opportunity. It's kind of migrating to where it wants to go across the street. So that's just a great plant to, to fill in. Um, again, pretty low water use. So you're going, okay, these are some specific examples. How do I find more? Well, my go-to place where I find plants is the calscape.org database uh, done by the California Native Plant Society. Um, it's super easy to use. It's a searchable database, um, provides information and resources. You can find uh, California native plants and research the plants and create a plant palette. And they've listed 7,990 plants native to California, and they break it down into all plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, and so forth. Um, the planting guide has great tips. Nursery resources tell you where to find the plants. You can make up a plant list. They provide you with a, a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet that you can do. And then butterflies, what's this? And this is where we get into the um, sort of the sciencey aspect of how do you uh, keep water in the environment. So instead of, and this is one of these big, big concepts that I promised you guys, a better question than what to plant is who to feed. And I'll tell you why this is important. Um, we, need, we know that plant species need pollinators to survive. So we know that pollinators are moving around the male genes of plants. Um, and uh, most flowering plants need these pollinators to do that so we can get seeds and we can get speciation, which is just how plants vary in their forms and color over time. Happens much more efficiently when we have bees moving the genes around than if things are wind pollinated, which is very random. Um, and so you're having the pollinators spreading those genes around so that other things can eat those plants like butterfly and moth larva. And you're thinking, well, why is that important? Moth larva, butterfly larva are caterpillars. Caterpillars are full of moisture. So we are going to, and this is a broad concept, we wanna keep moisture inside of organisms where it does the most good. And so but those biological factors then uh, become really important considerations in determining what to plant because a native plant will pass its moisture and other uh, nutrients and sort resources into the environment. So we want to conserve what those plants are providing. And those plants will get eaten uh, by these insects. And in Alameda County, you have 104 species of butterflies and moths. So a lot of great insects are going to be getting that plant moisture and holding it in the environment. So I think it, there's like some research says about 10% about of a garden's moisture is actually inside of the insects. And that's not an insubstantial amount. Um, so, but why native plants? Um, well, California is a biodiversity hotspot. Um, we have almost 8,000 species of plants here in California. Some found nowhere else on the planet, nowhere else in the United States even. We have more native plant species in California than any other state in the United States. Many of these species are drought tolerant because they evolved in California that has like 
in some places like less than 16 inches of rain per year. Um, we have a lot of native bee species moving those genes around, giving us all that diversity. 1600 species um, in California, more than any other state in the United States. And then in all through the United States, there's 4,000 species of native bees. But again, we have the most here in California. Um, honeybees are not native, I'm not gonna talk about those. Um, so here's, a broad, here's our broad concept. So remember I said, I'm all about function. And if we understand the function of how plants are working in the environment, then we can see how plants help take energy from the sun, the major input, and then turn that into resources for other things to eat. So energy from the sun is converted by plants, what they call the first trophic level, and trophic just means food. So that's the first food level, and that is then by eaten by insects and other animals. So that's the second food level. So that's how the sun's energy gets into the food web. And not only the sun's energy, but moisture from those plants goes into the food web. And when you plant native plants, you will have those insects eating those plants because those native insects will only eat those native plants that they evolved with. They're very picky eaters. They really like specific chemicals in plants and so only eat certain plants. So um, sort of the hierarchy of function here is that pollinators are moving around the genetic diversity for other things to access the sun's energy and provide it into the food web. So that's kind of like the architecture of function. So pollinators providing this keystone function for everything else. And that's how moisture is controlled by the biology of these, uh, of these organisms. So here we go. Plants are not decorations, they're food. And so uh, I think plants are great. They're pretty, they can be, they can be decorative, um, but you know, that's how we see them. Other things in the environment see them as dinner, breakfast, lunch, snacks. And so when you have native plants in your garden, you will attract many native pollinators and other insects and birds. And so these native plants are critical parts of sustaining life. They are critical parts of maintaining moisture in the environment. And so when I go to the nursery, <clears throat> I don't buy the hanging basket of pansies that have gone to seed. I'm looking for plants that have been chewed up a little bit because I know that those are tasty and those are gonna help me conserve moisture in the environment. So why is it important to see native plants as food? Um, because we know that these plants are gonna be super attractive to pollinators and butterfly larvae and moth larvae. Remember, you have over a hundred species in Alameda County that want to eat things. Um, we wanna help these organisms complete their life cycle. And when they complete their life cycles, they maintain the moisture in the environment. We wanna save every drop. And when we save organisms, we're saving moisture. And so we wanna avoid things called ecological traps. An ecological trap is something in the, in the environment that attracts organisms. And because of that attraction, makes it easier for them to be killed by predation or through other means. So we basically want our gardens, we want our choices, in the gardens, how we take care of those gardens to maintain the moisture. And that means keeping things alive, both the plants and those organisms that eat the plants. And so one of the ways that we do that with our native gardens, we know that native gardens uh, enhance connectivity and complexity in the landscape. And the more connectivity and complexity, the more plants support each other and that re leads to reduced irrigation needs. Um, less water use doesn't mean less plants. Actually, the, the opposite is basically true. The more that you add plants, the more that you're building a community of plants and other organisms that support each other and share water. Um, and so at some point, once you get enough plants, about 20 different species, your garden starts taking care of itself because the plants are taking care of each other. You have a community 
of plants. And so connectivity happens when plants reach down into the groundwater with a tap root, and then they distribute it through their lateral surface roots to other things uh, that are connecting between each other. And to maintain moisture in the environment, you can increase the complexity with things like uh, rocks to trap moisture underground, leaf piles that trap moisture underground, and roots will grow towards moisture. In fact, there was a study that was done showing that roots of plants actually grow towards the sound of water. So they know where moisture is. They don't have to sense moisture, they can actually hear it. So things go on with plants that we don't know, but plants have been doing this for a long time. They'll figure it out. Um, and over time, these native plant gardens with enough plants of the right types, they start taking care of themselves. Okay, they, they become sort of this super organism that um, takes care of itself. Uh, so what is a plant community? Um, and basically, so the California Native Plant Society says that it's a group of plant species living together and linked together by their effects on one another and the responses to the environment they share. Typically, this plant species that co-occur in a plant community show a definite association or affinity with each other. What this means is that for your particular area, plant the things that are locally native. And when you go to the CalScape website, you can choose those plants. You can select for those plants that typically grow in your area. Those are gonna be your plant community. Start with those, start with things that are local. Um, and we have a lot of different communities uh, in California. Um, we have coastal scrub, oak chaparral, which chaparral just means shrub, so oak shrubby areas. We have deserts, we have redwood forests, and so forth. All of these different communities have something in common. They are a function of the pollinators that live in them. Anytime you see things that are flowering, you've got bees. And bees, remember, their function in the environment is to spread the genetic diversity of other plants for other insects to eat. And so we want to aim for the majority of native plants in our gardens to be local species and appropriate for your local plant community. Again, just, uh, you know, bees are gonna be spreading. Here's pollen on this beautiful, uh, female bumblebee's back leg, um, which is the male genes. And that's how we get more plants. We get fertilization and seed formation. And when you have seed formation, you know that you have bees. So it's a, it's a healthy environment. Seeds mean, um, especially when you have a good seed set, really good, healthy environment. Um, and because these plants attract native bees so much, Native plants are actually good around food gardens as well because they will help those plants in your vegetable gardens to set fruit as well. Um, so what's the sequence of how you select plants? Um, the sequence that you want to do, one, fit in as many trees as possible. Then consider your shrub layer. Um, and a sh shrub layer should be over 60%. I tell people to focus on those evergreen shrubs because they're just easier to take care of. They look good all year round. Um, and then over time, keep adding more things, uh, grasses, perennials, bulbs, succulents, um, vines, you know. And so go for a mix of things to give you seasonal color, um, you know, things that smell nice. You know, once you have your, your backbone of trees and shrubs, then you start fluffing things up with perennials, bulbs. Bulbs are great because they require very little moisture. Um, and I always tell people, you know, we have a planting season. We want to plant during fall and winter for the best results because the soil is cooler and moister. And so those plant roots become established um, much more readily than when if the soil was hot and moist and that just leads to disease processes and it makes it harder for the plants to establish. And then use smaller plant sizes. Uh, it's just easier to dig a smaller hole than it is to dig a larger one. 
um, I planted hundreds, thousands of plants. The smaller I can get in the hole digging for, uh, activities, the better, um, or even use seeds. Seeds just want to grow. I use a lot of seeds. It's easier and it's free once you have plants generating those seeds because we've got a lot of bees making seeds for us. Um, and then when the plants are small, we use physical barriers like chicken wire to protect the small plants for a year or so until they're big enough so the squirrels don't dig them up. So, you know, don't feel like you have to do it all at once. Get your big stuff in first and then add stuff over time because a garden is a dynamic space and it will change over time um, because the garden will tell you what it wants, what it wants to plant where, and what organisms are attracted to your garden space. How do you lay things out? How do you make that plan so you can go to the garden center with your list, your tie, if you want to be all formal about it? So measure your space. And I tell people, use graph paper. It's just super easy. Um, if you have graph paper where the squares are maybe a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch, you can go, okay, I have eighth inch on a square. That can be one eighth inch equals a foot. That's the scale. So you can draw things to scale on those. Um, go through, select those plants that you like, um, draw them at their mature diameters as circles. Um, and so big stuff first, and then the smaller stuff in those circles should overlap a little bit or just basically touch. And then you can get numbers of plants. Um, you know exactly where things go, what to plant. Um, I always tell people, you know, add pathways before you place your plants because you wanna be able to get in there, know where you can walk. And this actually adds a nice structure to the garden. Um, where you get nice edges, where you can plant along low stuff along the edges, taller stuff towards the back. Super easy way to design it yourself. It's really not that hard. Um, and, you know, gardening is, is one of those forgiving things that if something doesn't work, you could try something else. Um, you know, it's not the end of the world when a plant dies. I have lots of plants that die sometimes. Um, but there are other things to try, um, certainly different species and different genera. Um, but we want to start with trees uh, for a number of different reasons, because um, trees are great. We have a lot of keystone species that are plants. And what do we mean by keystone species? Keystone plants, like the bees, are forming the backbone of support in the environment. So if you imagine a stone arch where the, the middle stone is holding up the entire arch, that's what a keystone species does. And keystones plant, keystone plants form the backbone of habitat resources, food, shelter, and nesting sites. And so how can you tell what a keystone species is? Um, on Calscape, remember we can rank plants according to the number of butterflies that they feed. And so if you have uh, a plant that feeds 50 species versus one that feeds 10, the one that feeds more species is gonna be more of a keystone species than the one that feeds fewer. This is one of those broad concepts. So if you have to choose between things and you can't quite decide, go with the things that are going to be connected to more things in the environment. Because remember, the more you can connect things, the more resilient a garden is going to be, there are going to be more connections to hold everything together. And in Alameda County, there are 15 species of trees native. So look at those different species, try to find those that fit in uh, with your particular situation and choose the one that has the most connections to the other things in the environment. Why trees first? Because trees help save water. <laughs> and so we want the water to be in living organisms. And so um, trees absorb water, release it into the air, cooling and cleaning it. So benefits for the humans, um, they form half of the rain cycle. They help circulate water through the environment. Um, 
They just improve water quality by filtering rainwater, slowing down the impacts of heavy rain. They reduce flooding, they stabilize soil. And oaks, for example, feed lots of different um, species. So the moisture from the oaks is going to be shared with other organisms. So um, oaks are keystone species. And um, you may not have room in your own home garden for a, a big coast live oak. This is my husband here, he's six foot three inches tall. Um, if you have a big yard, it might work, but smaller yards, you might do a scrub oak or other uh, smaller tree species um, that, that work as well. Uh, we know that clouds form more often over forested areas than non-forested areas because of that water cycling. And the cooling effects of clouds and carbon dioxide capture by trees more than offset the reflection of the sun during times when the deciduous trees are bare, when they drop all their leaves. So the overall net effect of planting trees pays you back more than any other sort of downside that a tree might have. The benefits outweigh all the other impacts. So that's why we start with trees. Again, oaks uh, here in the Santa Clara Valley, um, tree, the oaks used to be, especially Quercus lobata, the valley oak, used to be 61% of the tree cover. Now it's about 1%. So I'm always trying to plant more valley oaks. Um, they're a keystone species. Again, um, the valley oak drops all its leaves, but the leaves feed the tree for the next year. They also provide valuable places for other insects to overwinter. Um, a lot of insects basically spend a lot of time as larva and pupa, and they hang out in leaf litter. So those little bags of moisture are hanging out in the leaf litter. So we just leave the leaves where they drop. Um, those tap roots seek out the water table and then support other organisms um, with their lateral surface roots, which sharing water with the other plants. You plant native plants underneath because they like native plants to be underneath. They don't like non-native plants. So kind of like, who's this? I don't know this person. Um, and they can live a very long time, 600 years. So it's one of these things that you just plant it once and generations will benefit. So these plants help the environment, not only in your lifetime, but several lifetimes down the road. So it's something that will benefit future generations. So trees are really like, in terms of doing more to conserve moisture, it's really a bang for the buck for, you know, for decades, for centuries even. Um, and plus they're valuable, they add value to your real estate. Um, I always tell people though, if they're really looking for lower maintenance, plant evergreen, um, things that don't drop all their leaves all at once. Um, because some things look green all year, look great, super easy to take care of. I, we only prune occasionally if branches are blocking pathways or sight lines. So uh, pretty low maintenance. But you're going, okay, so 15 trees. What do you have planted in your yard, Juanita? Um, I'm a plant freak. I have to have everything, one of everything, which is why I have native plant gardens in city property because I wanted more space to plant everything. I want all the plants. Um, but in my own yard, I have, um, these are a dozen of the native species that I have, but I also have an orange tree. I have a couple apple trees um, as well. So I have a lot of trees. I have Acer macrophyllum, which is the big leaf maple. I have Circocarpus betuloides. I'm going across the top here, um, which is a great small, narrow, upright tree that's evergreen, works great, very low water use. I also have the desert willow. Willows are great uh, keystone species. They do use a little bit more water than other things. And I hand water this tree. Um, so that's what I do a lot is, you know, when I plant things, I don't have um, drip irrigation in my own yard. I, my yard is so dinky that it's really a waste of energy to like try to keep up with drip irrigation for me. So I hand water uh, things, which is really super low water use for us. We have the elderberry. I have Prunus alicifolia, which is evergreen, um, very low water use. We have Acer negundo, 
um, are street trees and Modesto ash. I have Coralus cornuta hazelnuts because I like I like hazelnuts; they're tasty. Um, we have Prunus virginiana, Arctostaphylus, Circus, Hedermelias, or beautifulia. I tell you, the, the Hedermelias, the, the Toyon, I planted that sucker and I have never watered it since, and it's grown like a weed. So there are some things that just will do great for you. I always tell people, you know, Hedermelias, you almost cannot kill these things. Um, so lots of different choices. Um, and I, I like to experiment with things um, in my own home garden. Um, native shrubs, you know, if you don't like the dry desiccated look, if you want something green and lush, these are all plants in my home garden. Vaccinium ovatum, our native huckleberry, look how beautiful that is, with edible berries, very tasty. Um, the tubular flower early in the winter and spring that are pollinated by big fat bumblebees that come out in the wintertime. Our native coffee berry, look at how beautiful and glossy those leaves are. It looks like this all year round. This will actually get really big. Um, there are varieties that stay smaller, um, but green and glossy looks very tropical, but pretty low water use. Arctostaphylus as a ground cover, Ribes viburnifolium. So lots of, lots of choices that people can, can get that they like. Um, now, another way to keep moisture in the environment are succulents. And I love succulents, but what is a succulent? From Wikipedia, they say the word succulent comes from the Latin word succus, meaning juice or sap. Um, and so a simple and broad definition of plants that store water in their tissues, making them resistant to drought. Super low maintenance. Um, lots of choices here. Um, this is, these are in my home garden. These grow out on the coast. But we have cactus, we have Luisias, agaves, sedums, crassula, leptocyanes, dudleyas, and bulbs. Bulbs are succulent because they store water in their tissues. And they're storing it underground, which is a great place for water to uh, hang out. And there's 188 succulents native to California. So lots to try, certainly. Um, some of my favorites are the Dudleyas. There are 45 species. Um, and I just love these things. They're super easy to grow from seed. They seem to um, defy gravity. They can grow on vertical surfaces. So if you want a low maintenance plant, um, Dudleyas are probably your best friend. I mean, look at this thing. It's literally growing on a rock where there's a little moss in nature with no one to take care of it. So um, you can't really get much more low maintenance than, than that. Um, Dudleyas, again, these are in my home garden. We have uh, Dudleya virens um, in March versus September when it's looking a little drier. So a finger form holds its shape better than the flat leaves. Um, this is the Dudleya bretonii, which you know, once it gets moisture and it fluffs out and sends up a bloom spike um, in March versus September when it starts to conserve moisture and dry up a little bit with these dried leaves. Um, but again, you know, super easy uh, plant, a couple of different forms to play with. And you can combine them with other plants to get um, lots of different textures going and contrast between a beautiful gray green with this beautiful sedum here with an Arctostaphylus. So contrast between light and dark can give you some real visual interest in the garden. But if you look closely at this, there's so much going on here. And this is in nature. This isn't any garden that I designed. This is actually out in the wilds. And so we have sedum growing. Um, and we have plants coming up in between the sedums. We've got a cedar tree growing back here. We've got wild roses growing and Arctostaphylus in a small area. So what nature is telling us is that she wants to be complex. She wants a lot of different connections. So these plants play well together. They are part of a plant community. Um, how easy is it to take care of native plant gardens? So native gardens are less maintenance than non-native gardens with lawns. Um, Basically what you're doing, once the garden is established and it takes on this sort of 
self-care mechanism, basically your, your work is going to be keeping weeds at bay, anything that you don't want in there, um, dandelions, you know, non-native grasses coming up, um, you know, there are all kinds of weird weeds that come up, some oxalis that looks nasty, and you just pull those out. You want to irrigate the plants to establish about once a week, and I, I love hand watering because it really helps you engage with those plants and keep an eye on them, so you sort of develop a relationship with them as they develop relationships with each other. Um, your irrigation should encourage the roots to search for water. Remember I told you that the roots will seek out water, whether under leaf piles, under rocks, or even the sound of water. You wanna prune sparingly to control uh, dried up dead material for fire safety. You don't need to fertilize, so you can save money. Amend sparingly. We mulch to control weeds initially in our gardens. And then uh, to help establish the plants. And then basically we mulch with leaves. So anything that's deciduous in the gardens, we just leave those leaves where they are. And that forms a nice thick layer of leaf litter, litter, but really leaf mulch underneath of our plants. And then if we want it to look a little tidier, then we put a skim coat of bark chips on the top for that nice uniform look. Um, we also leave some areas of bare dirt for bee nests because bees, 70% of bees will nest underground. Um, and we don't use leaf blowers in planted areas um, because we don't wanna be blowing away the leaves that are holding moisture in and forming places for organisms that are little bags of moisture that they like to hide out. We don't wanna blow those away. Um, and we don't use pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides. So, um, Really, we do more by doing less. So a native plant garden, just easier to take care of. You're not paying the mow and blow guys. You're not mowing. Um, and so it's actually, it's just less work. Um, and we're also avoiding those ecological traps. Remember with these native plant gardens, um, they are very attractive because it's food and food is an attraction, let's face it, um, to organisms. Um, and we want to help optimize the reproductive success of these organisms. We want them to complete their life cycles, which completes, which keeps that moisture in the environment. And with your native plant garden, with its abundant blooms for nectar and pollen for bees and host plants for butterfly and moth larvae are very attractive to those insects. It, the, the difference between native gardens versus non-native gardens is night and day. And so that ecological trap is something in the environment that lures an organism in that makes that environment unfit to help them complete their life cycle. So um, we connect habitats together so things don't become isolated. Reducing light pollution at night is a huge one that you know helps with birds migrating because birds migrate at night and lights at night can really interfere with that behavior. We have blackout curtains in our windows um, at our house so that moths are not attracted to light um, at windows and at uh, windows and the lights outside at night can attract uh, these insects and they just fly towards the light until they're completely exhausted and they die or they're eaten by something else. And 60% of your insects can die in a single night because of these uh, traps. Um, so you want to minimize that as much as possible. We want to leave our leaves because many insects that become larvae and pupa overwinter and shelter in those leaves. And when we blow those leaves away, we blow away those little bags of moisture. Uh, we want to eliminate the use of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, which can get into the soil where those native bees are nesting. Um, and those chemicals can interfere with the development of the next generation of, of bees. And we want to reduce as much gasoline exhaust fumes as possible because the fumes interfere with the senses that insects are using to get around because they smell those things and that can interfere with the behaviors that they need to do to complete their life cycles. So, um, you know, we plant the native plants, but there are all these other factors, these broad concepts that can help us 
really squeeze the best use out of every single drop of water in the environment. So with these broad concepts and sort of like how we take care of our native gardens to really keep that moisture in the garden, when you think about it among those other ecosystem services and saving money on water and maintenance, the more that you understand these relationships in nature, you learn how to optimize that productivity in your native garden. That will lead to an abundance of life, which is how you maintain that moisture, as well as the enhancement of your appreciation and your role in caring for nature's complex beauty and really being super um, conservative with the way that moisture is used and conserved in the environment. And that, with those, uh, broad concepts, I'll be happy to uh, open it up to questions. Thank you, Juanita. Wow, that was very, very informative. I love some of the images too that you included in your presentation. So attendees, feel free to put some questions in the chat or at the Q&A, I mean, um, but we'll go ahead and get started with some of the questions that came in. James asks, I'm a huge fan of agave. Do you happen to know how many species of agave are native to California? You know, I don't know that off the top of my head, <laughs> um, but a, a quick search at CalScape will tell you, and it will tell you where they grow. You can find the nurseries that have them, and it, you can click on the nursery and find the nursery's inventory list of their available inventories, so that saves you a trip. Um, so you can become really efficient with your you know, your trips to the nursery so you don't become like the guy with the hanging pot of pansies that have gone to seed. <laughs> Take those stock photos, just jokes to write themselves. Um, <laughs> so, um, but, you know, have a plan, you know, look up. It's super easy to look it up. And that's, you know, I go to Calscape uh, to see, you know, just what's out there. And I'm always on the hunt for good plants. But there are plants that I, I now have been using over and over again that have worked so great in our gardens. And I would encourage people to go and visit some native plant gardens so you can see what these look like out there planted in people's yards, in test plots. Um, and, you know, the test plots, depending on how much people take care of those, can look different than how they look in people's yards. And I know that the California Native Plant Society does these garden tours every year. You can sign up to go and see people's gardens to see how they look. And, you know, people eh, don't want native plant gardens because they look like weeds. They actually don't, you know. If you use plants that are evergreen and have a nice shape, they look just like a non-native plant garden but they're so much better at conserving moisture than a non-native plant garden. So lots of resources out there uh, to make those decisions about, you know, what's gonna work best for your own situation. Yeah, thanks. And I think that's one of the best ways to get inspiration. If you're seeing a plant that you like and, you know, bees or butterflies are flocking to it, you can oh, absolutely. Um, put in your own garden and of course there's the primrose gardens in palo alto but the alameda county water district also has a demonstration garden at their headquarters in fremont that actually has like plant tags so if you see something you like that you can actually write down the uh, species and put it in your own garden they're all low water use thank you for that so is um next question is from sue she says is there any is there a mulch that you recommend that won't increase fire danger near buildings? Um, so the, I like to use the bark chips, like a redwood bark chip is really good because you know redwood is doesn't really catch on fire as easily, um, rather than something like a shredded bark mulch, which is basically tinder. So something that is chunky um, is gonna work better. And also if you use plants that are more fire resistant too, um, and this comes up a lot. So it's like, what are plants that are fire resistant? So things like Toyon, the Heteromelias of Butifolia is fire resistant. Baccarus pulularis, the coyote bush is fire resistant. Succulents, obviously, fire resistant. 
So there are a lot of fire resistant plants that don't catch on fire as easily. Um, but yeah, you don't want to use things like gorilla hair uh, because that's like that's like tinder. So, um, and you know, also clean up. I would clean up leaves from like eucalyptus um, because eucalyptus leaves have a lot of oil in them, and um, that can be kind of flammable. So those are there are plants that you definitely want to stay away from. Things that have a lot of uh, oils in them. Um, but I do like the the bark chips from redwoods um, because those seem to they're they look nice and they're um, lower flammability um, as well. I mean, just about everything if it's hot enough will catch on fire. So um, you know, uh, take what I say, you know, not as like fireproofing, but you know, re reducing fire risk, not completely getting rid of it completely. Um, yeah, and the, the Sonoma County Water District actually came out with some fire resistant designs for their communities after the Napa fires because everyone was redesigning their landscape, rebuilding their homes. And right. so they have some good resource. And I remember one tip from that is never to put the mulch right up to the house. You right. know, you want some space between the house and the garden. So it, yes. um, the defensible kind of space. Of, right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sometimes as a landscape architect, I will design those wildland interfaces for clients where they're close to a forest, which always makes me nervous. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like, and then those plans actually, when people are building new houses, have to be approved by the fire district. And so, um, you know, they, they make their determination based on the plan, whether it's going to work or not. Um, you know, and if I were to buy a property in those areas, I would invest in a fire suppression system just because, you know, and those are things that actually spray fire retardant on your house. Those things actually exist. Um, people don't know about those, but that's something that I would recommend to clients um, who, are, who are building in those remote areas where it might be hard to get to in a really nasty fire situation. So, um, you know, over over engineer for those things don't just rely on the you know oh we planted it right so we should be good you know always have several fail safe devices and strategies in place can't be too careful yeah thank you for that and great question sue very yeah very good question um you're getting a lot of compliments in the chat uh james says Juanita, this is absolutely fantastic Thanks for an incredible presentation. Um, we have a question, are there any gopher resistant native plants? Um, so, you know, people ask me a lot about uh, the underground rodents. And what I tell people is when you're first planting things, if you have an issue with those rodents, uh, when you dig the hole, you can actually line that hole with chicken wire and then plant in it. And then the roots will grow out through there, but the main cluster of roots will be protected against rodents. Um, and then what you can do also is like cover those on the top with a uh, chicken wire until they're established. And then you can put maybe some um, raptor perches up so that um, you know a, a hawk or something or a falcon can sit on a perch and get good, get those good bags of rodent moisture for snacks and meals. Um, also, you can put up an owl box, you know, to catch things at night. So keep that food chain going. Um, I don't really know of anything that's really um, gopher resistant. Um, I always say that when things get out of balance, it's because there aren't enough predators. And so, you know, provide um, some protection for the plants, but also it's like, you know, there's a meal here and let's make it easier for that food web to be strengthened by providing perches and nesting areas. Yeah, that's definitely one thing we learned. It's all connected, right? <laughs> um, Juanita, do you have a favorite succulent? Someone would like to know. So I'm really partial to the uh, Dudleya farinosa which is our uh, Dudleyas that grow out on the coast. And um, 
some people don't know this, but those plants get poached out in the wild uh, because there's a big overseas black market for them. So people are stealing our biological diversity and it's actually a crime in California to steal those. So you can report what? people if you, yes, I know. You can report people who are, if you see people poaching plants out in the wild, get license numbers and report those suckers because that's a crime here in California. It's like that biological diversity is like stealing from our bank vault. And I, and it's ridiculous because Dudleys are super easy to grow from seeds. You know, I have a client who lives out on the North coast and they've got Dudleys growing on their cliffs and people will like park in adjacent areas and steal from their private property. So she has been collecting seeds for me to grow out for her. Um, so I, I do some growing of things like that for people. And I was very surprised to see just how easy it is to grow these things. Um, so I have a soft spot for the Dudley Afarinosas. They're just such sweet little plants. They take a while to get to size. Um, and so true story here. So she, she gave me these seed heads and she's like, I don't know how old these are. Or like if there's any seeds left, she goes, I looked for the seeds and I know the seeds are like microscopic. They're really hard to see. So I was like, okay. So I took the seed heads, clipped them off into some pots, watered them and watered them and watered them. Nothing happened. I thought, well, maybe she was right. So this was a couple of years ago. I knew that we were going to have a big rainstorm. So I put everything out to be rained on. And you know what? Right after these seed heads got rainwater on them, they sprouted. It's like, hmm, rainwater was- Rainwater. Different. Yes. It's like, what is it about rainwater? And I've been trying to figure this out. And it's like, you know, I learn stuff all the time about like, you know, how it really works. Nature has figured things out. So it's like rainwater made it sprout. Uh, why? I don't know. You know, so plants love it. <laughs> plants, yeah. Maybe it's the dissolved nitrogen in it. Maybe there's like other nutrients. I don't know. Hmm. You know it, maybe the purity, maybe the, the no chlorine or fluorine or whatever's in the water, fluoride. I, it, eh. You know, so there's a research project if I had more time, <laughs> that publication going, um, you know, tap water versus purified rainwater, you know, you know. Yeah, that's a good plug for our next workshop on the 26th. We'll be learning about how to capture that rainwater. And apparently it's really beneficial for plants versus potable they water. To, so they really seem to, and it's like some magic elixir in it. Um, <laughs> Lots of mysteries out there that I, I need to get to the bottom of these mysteries and I see them every day. Well, thank you for that. Um, ready for another question? Yeah. Is there a demonstration garden on the peninsula? Uh, this person lives in Redwood City. Um, so there's uh, there's all kinds. If you, if you Google uh, Palo Alto pollinator gardens, you can see our five gardens. But there are um, demonstration gardens at various parks like Eleanor Party Park. And in Palo Alto, they just put a pedestrian bridge over Highway 101. And Grassroots Ecology did a, a planting underneath that of native plants. There are um, demonstration gardens like in Bull Park Preserve here. They're really all over the place. Um, you know, I think also there's uh, the CNPS website for the Santa Clara Valley chapter has gardens on their map. Um, I'm trying to think they've got one, they've got a pretty large one um, down in San Jose. You know, just uh, do a Google uh, pollinator gardens, native plant garden demonstration gardens. They're, they're all over the place um, on the peninsula. Yeah, and one thing that happens, um, it's not a demonstration garden, but it's kind of a tour. Um, it's called Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour. Yep, yeah. And that's a great, you basically go to people's homes that are showcasing their landscape and it's all native. And um, it happens in May each year, but they're all throughout the peninsula, uh, the mm -hmm. San Jose area, and Alameda County. And it's really great to kind of learn from your neighbors' tips and tricks. So be sure to 
look out for that uh, next year. Um, any other questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we just have a uh, thank you for this excellent presentation. Any other final thoughts, Vanita? Um, you know, I would tell people just to, you know, don't be afraid of doing it wrong. Um, start with trees and it's, there's almost no way to, to mess it up because if something doesn't work, just try something else. Um, and know that a garden is dynamic and changes over time and the plants will tell you in their way if they're happy or not. Um, and just be ready for the explosion of life that you will see in your gardens. You will have butterflies um, all over the place, you know, and you'll, you know, I use the iNaturalist app to see what different species come out because I don't know all of the species, what they are. Um, so I'm always interested in what their life cycles are. And it's just like, oh yeah, they are active during July, but then it goes down. And I'm always amazed at just how um, how much other life comes into the gardens, not just animal life, but other plant life. So other native plants will move into your gardens. So before you think something is a weed and pull it out, make sure that, you know, it's like, because what I've noticed is like uh, Baccarus, the, the native coyote bush has just kind of moved in to a few of the gardens in my home garden, especially. It's just like, Oh, native plants live here. You know, I don't know what's going on. You know, was there all the other plants are going, oh, here's a good spot right here. I don't know, you know, and then the, there's like this weird fungus that was coming up in my yard. And I was like, what is this? And so I looked it up and it's actually um, an ectomycorrhizal fungus called Pisolithus tinctorius, otherwise known as dead man's foot fungus or bohemian truffle, which I prefer that one. Um, and that forms a coating on the roots of plants that will take uh, new, uh, minerals from the soil and exchange it, those minerals for carbohydrates with the plant roots. And I've got those bohemian truffles coming up everywhere. And so now I harvest those truffles because um, they're not edible, so don't think truffle, yay, yummy. Um, but the spores, you can, and this is a secret tip that I have, I use the spores in my planting holes. Um, and it's, you just basically crumble it in. You can actually dip cuttings in the spores if you wanna raise more plants, because that actually helps plants root out from cuttings more easily. And people pay for this and it's like free and it's coming up everywhere. So it's like, stuff happens in these gardens and this self-assembling organism just happens it's like magic i'm not making it up it's actually it it's a real thing so i tell people just like you know go out first go to calscape see a tree you want to get and go this weekend and and find that tree and get it into the ground and just watch the sit back and watch the magic happen because you will say, wow, I should have gone native years ago because this is super great. Um, you will have, you know, when I go out and water things, moths will come flying out of the bushes. And it's like, yes, I know I'm doing it right. It always startles me when I see these, and there's some of them are not small. As they fly out, ah, scares me. But it's like, yay. And I have so much bird life coming to my yard. It's, you know, once you go native, you never go back once you see what happens. It's like, don't be afraid, just do it. Yeah, I love that. I was thinking the same thing. This weekend would be a great time because it's fall. So it's a great time to plant, especially it natives. Is. It is. And when you plant that tree, you know, I mean, it's like maybe a weekend's work of getting that one tree in, but that tree will provide connections for decades and it will do good things for years to come. So you've kind of reached into the future with those networks and made everything more resilient. So it's like this, it's almost, it's almost like magic, but it's so accessible. It's like, everybody can be a magician. You just get the plant, you know? <laughs> we do have one additional question uh, that asks, do you know if Bosca helps design common areas for homeowners associations? I think 
I can take that one. Um, Bosca d does have like sample designs, uh, which are mainly for residential, but common area and commercial landscapes, usually you seek out like a landscape designer or architect, um, which Bosca and ECW don't necessarily like, endorse certain private entities like that. So simple search, or I don't know if Juanita, if you have any resources for like designers. I do actually. Yeah. Um, one that I really like, and I use the company in my own home garden is California Nativescapes. Um, they, they do a bang up job. They know what is a weed and what is not because they know what, what are the native plants. And I've given them tasks that are just, you know, like really nitpicky and they do design and installation. They're a licensed contractor and they also do designs and they do great work. Um, you know, I also, I mean, I use a lot of different resources, but um, the California Native Plant Society does have garden resources as well as designers. Um, so you can go through their list as well and see who might be available, who's more local to your area um, and see if they do uh, and uh, works for work for HOAs. Yeah, and that um, attendee was anonymous, but I did just want to add that um, a few months ago, the state banned the irrigation of uh, common area landscape in HOAs that are non-functional turf. So areas that are just purely ornamental that aren't um, used for recreation, you can't irrigate them right now because of the drought. So it's a perfect time to kind of rethink that common area landscape. And as Juanita said, is that grass really functional? Is it being used? Are there other ways that we can utilize that space? So definitely check out the rebate. Um, several Bay Area agencies also have uh, rebates right now for ripping out that lawn. Um, thank you so much, Juanita. Everyone really enjoyed it. Thank you for the chat and the questions and the um, gratitudes to you. This has been great. This is recorded, so we will be posting it to the website as well as Bosco's website. And thank you all attendees for joining us this morning. Wish we could give a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just, you know, I encourage everybody to, to go out there, you know, plant a tree this weekend. Um, you know, I, I really believe in the power, the immense power of biology, because, you know, we live on a living planet, you know, and biology is how it works. And so, and the, the power, the power is literally at our fingertips and it's so easy to do. Literally start with one tree, you know, get hooked, and there's, you know, once you get hooked, there's no going back. So, you know, it can become an obsession, which is not a bad thing. So go out there, have some fun with it. Go see some native gardens, go look at the butterflies, um, you know, and then just plant your own and watch the explosion of life that will happen. And it will happen. It's a guarantee. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> I love that, Juanita. Thank you. What a nice note to end on. Very inspirational. Thank you all. I'm going to go ahead and end it. Have a great e uh, rest of your weekend. Thanks. Bye. Take care, Megan. <laughs>